And so today we're going to be talking about hope in the life of our city with someone who knows a great deal about hope and knows a great deal about process. Michael Marsicano is the president and CEO of the Foundation for the Carolinas. And it would take um, hours upon hours to describe all the things that Michael has been engaged in and all the people that he's, been, that he's convened and all the incredible things that have happened because of his leadership. Um, he has, uh, among many things, has raised over $3.5 billion for cultural, educational, and socioeconomic initiatives in our region. And it is a tremendous honor, Michael, to have you here today at Christ Church. Let us welcome Michael Moscano. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Michael, tell us, what exactly is the Foundation for the Carolinas? Chip, I wish there were an elevator speech for it. Yeah. Uh, it's a pretty complex uh, organization. Uh, it's a community foundation. And then people say, well, what's a community foundation? Right. Uh, unlike private foundations, which are just one family, or um, corporate foundations, it's essentially a cooperative of different funds and different families and different corporations and different nonprofits who open funds with us. And we have 3,000 different funds that we serve. And so building philanthropic capital and, uh, is one of our pillars. And then using that philanthropic capital for civic leadership is our second pillar. And that makes us a community foundation. Say something about the journey that you have been on in your life to sort of get to this place. I'm, I'm sort of wondering uh, if there was a particular moment in your journey where there was a summons uh, to, to pay attention, to, to get more interested and involved. And just tell us a little bit about that, because I think we're all on this sort of journey of trying to figure out meaning and purpose in our life and what it means often with the big problems uh, to, to, to engage and to be able to make a difference. I think many of us might answer that question with um, our parents. Uh, my parents were both in the public schools and very dedicated to that profession, but then very civically involved. My mother chaired the Arts Council in, her, in our community and she chaired the Historic Organization and the Literary Society and all these different uh, things. So I saw service <laughs> Uh, modeled in my, in my parents. Uh, for those of you that are Carolina grads, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going here. Um, I have three degrees from Duke. So I was at Duke for a long period of time, and I overlapped with uh, Terry Sanford. And if there's an iconic North Carolinian who exemplifies service, uh, it would be Terry Sanford. And because I was there for eight years, I got to work closely with him as a, a student on a lot of different trustee committees and things. Mm -hmm. And I think he inspired me greatly in the area of serving. So for, so for those of us that are sort of new to North Carolina, can tell us about who Terry Sanford was. Uh, I, I, I forget my age sometimes. <laughs> um, so Terry Sanford uh, is, is, was a, uh, an incredible governor of, of North Carolina. He also was a senator from our state, and he did run for president as well. Um, during all of that, uh, he came to be the president of Duke University as part of his journey. Um, so he's the exemplar of public service, at least in the elected sphere. And what was it that you saw about him that, that, that moved you? His remarkable ability to pull people together from different walks of life and different viewpoints and bring them to consensus. And I've tried to draw on watching him in times where that's harder and harder than perhaps it was at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and I re reflect back on some of his uh, uh, techniques. He had a remarkable ability to, uh, you, he, he could tell you no, and you would walk out thinking you heard yes. <laughs> I mean, he, he just, he was very charismatic and um, high antenna, be able to read a room well, bring the threads together of what people are saying and come up with the gestalt. So I want to get into that in, in, in a little while, but I, I want to talk to you about what you've learned about generosity uh, in your work. Mm -hmm. What exactly is a philanthropist? I mean, I think we have this sort of 
this this idea in our minds of um, of, a, of a, a super wealthy person, um, frankly, generally, a, you know, uh, someone who, who comes into the space with their own ideas. So there are, they're both uh, beautiful images of philanthropy and also images that um, have mixed motives. Yeah. Uh, so say something about, in your mind, when you think about a philanthropist, what does it mean to be a philanthropist? Well, I would say that the word philanthropy uh, was transformed in the 20th century. Its original roots have nothing to do with money. Hmm. A philanthropist is someone who cares for the welfare of others. Hmm. That's the strict definition. Um, but in the, what we would call the robber baron age of the 20s, uh, philanthropy became more associated with great wealth and the items of philanthropy such as service and time commitment and just basic generosity kind of move to this view of philanthropists or the word philanthropist, the word philanthropy to be associated with great wealth. And I think that's very unfortunate mm. because the truth of the matter is in terms of generosity, um, we find based on studies, you and I have talked about the book American Generosity that we both read, um, uh, philanthropy has no income barriers. Uh, people who are poor can be as much a philanthropist as people who are rich and sometimes give more in terms of money than uh, as a percentage of their disposable income than the, some of the wealthiest of us. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's unfortunate that it's been moved to that stricter definition in modern society of being associated with great wealth mm -hmm. because its roots are really not that. Everyone can be a philanthropist. That's a wonderful thought, isn't it? Hello, philanthropists. <laughs> uh, let's, though, uh, go back to this, uh, this monumental work, American Generosity, and, and dig into it for a moment, because it really is quite interesting. Um, when the study was done, there was uh, quite a bit of thought given to the various ways that, that people give. Mm -hmm. There are remarkable numbers of ways, but they they tend to sort of fall in the sort of, as you remember, the three major the categories. Mm -hmm. Giving money, mm -hmm. um, giving uh, time. Service. And then civic engagement. I think the author even described it as far as political action for charitable causes. Precisely. Uh, which in today's challenging time, one could use the word political action as being something what I don't think was intended by Exactly. The, I think it was civic engagement. Civic engagement, right. yes. So I wonder what you make of those statistics uh, mm -hmm. as I remember them, and I may have these wrong, um, not exactly, but I think they're pretty close, that 48% of Americans give money away and they tend to give between 1% and 3% of income. And as mm -hmm. you said, actually the people who give the largest percentage of their income are actually people on the lower end of the, of the, of the scale. Tell me what, what you make of that. 48% uh, and, uh, and that the people at the lower end tend to give the most mm -hmm. as a percentage of income. Let me start with the latter. Okay. I think people at the lower end of the income are subject to the need and therefore probably have more, this is a, I don't want to get stereotypical, yep. but they are so in touch with the need because in part they're closer to it than those of us have great wealth, um, that they have a higher level of experienced empathy. Not empathy as a human being, but experienced empathy. Mm -hmm. um, so I, w I, w I would say that. Um, uh, and then I, and, and the first part of it was. As a, the, the only 48% Get yeah, money away. Um, I was at first troubled by that statistic, and I was even more troubled by the fact that 30% were only serving. And by that, serving means volunteering at a soup kitchen, a, a, a food bank, or um, being on boards. I would have thought that would have been much higher. Right. We think that we are much higher than that here in Charlotte. Um, this particular book didn't focus in on cities per se. Mm -hmm. um, 
but uh, I, I would have thought the number, the percentage, would have been higher on both giving and on um, us, uh, serving. Uh, wasn't quite as surprised on the political action and for, for causes. Um, and I think it, it gets to where do we learn? Generosity is a learned behavior. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we, in terms of having children, we are in co-creation of doing that in partnership with God, mm -hmm. and therefore I think we are all born good, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean we are all actively generous. Mm. And so how do, you, how do you learn to be generous? Um, you either learn it from your family, you either learn it from your social and peer group, um, you learn it from your church, and in fact, when you look at another study chip, um, the highest church attendance in the United States is Salt Lake City, 59%. Mm. And they have the highest percentage of giving. Mm. Don't tell me those aren't, they're not just correlated, there's causation there. Right. Uh, the, the people of Salt Lake City give 10.6% of their disposable income away. Mm. Charlotte gives 5.9%, so there's a Pretty big difference there. So that's where I don't remember exactly how churched we are. I don't, we're not as high as 59%. Um, and then the fourth reason, which particularly for the wealthy um, will get them in the generosity time frame, is the tax deduction. And if I may, I'd like to pause on that because yep. the other three you probably wouldn't have surprised about your family, your peers, and social setting, and your. And, and, church and you would you would initially think that the tax deduction would be well that's a no-brainer because you know you give less money to Uncle Sam it is a profound concept the tax deduction and we take we take it for granted and I and let me let me explain what it really means the founders of our country said for a checks and balance on government if you give to help someone else through a nonprofit, we will tax you less. You will give less to Uncle Sam if you give to help others. There's nowhere in the world that has that kind of system. But then on top of that, we can give to something that contradicts Uncle Sam. So if Uncle Sam believes in correctional facilities, which it does, and you want to abolish prisons, you can give to a nonprofit even if it's against what the government's doing. Mm -hmm. That's unbelievable. And then, if you don't like the government doing something different than you do with your tax dollars, you can vote the, the government out. I mean, this is an astounding, profound experience we share. Mm -hmm. And I find that people enter the tax deduction issue on the wealthy side, often because professional advisors, attorneys, tax accountants, bankers, brokers say, you know, you need to do this. Um, some come from the other three areas to do it, but then I find that wealthy people who may start with a tax deduction then get involved with nonprofits hmm. and they learn the, the wonderful thing that generosity can be in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I wanted to pause on that tax deduction thing because when you're taking the tax deduction, understand how profound th this, this, this really is. Mm -hmm. The problem with the percentage is we've now done the standard deduction at a higher level and stopped the ability for more modest means to even itemize. Wow. Yeah. So we're seeing the beginning of a falling there Mm. in the numbers, even while we're seeing an increase in great wealth going toward philanthropy. And that breaks, that's another example of the economic divide in this deeply American practice. Mm. Um, so one of those ways, and if you don't get it one of those ways, I don't know how else you get it. If it's not from your family, if it's not from your peer setting, if it's not because you seek out the tax deduction, and if it's not because of your house of worship, and how else you get it. Right. And I think that definitely flows into that second category as well, which is volunteerism yeah. at 38%. And it's, it's interesting that um, as in terms of service, 
that uh, you know one could argue that well people are busy and they certainly are but it's it's interesting to note that when people retire they don't necessarily spend more time volunteering and 93 percent of that time is actually spent in leisure that which was a, I support leisure let me just say um, that was a big surprise for me mm -hmm. because my experience in Charlotte would suggest otherwise. Mm. But what this book says is that retired folks are not volunteering um, as much as we would have expected. What it also was interesting to say, which gives me great hope, is that the student age population is volunteering at great numbers. Mm -hmm. In fact, another book I read suggests that this young group is mirroring the greatest generation in how it's doing things. Hmm which is very hopeful. Yes, very hopeful. Unfortunately, if you think of why that might be the case, the greatest generation lived through World War II. This generation, my children's generation, has lived through 9-11, the Great Recession, and the pandemic. Three equally traumatic experiences. That's what their life has been. And I'm not gonna compare that to World War II, but it is very negative things that have happened in their life that I think is in part propelling this sense of service and empathy. So if the next generation is gonna be like the greatest, mm -hmm. there's a lot of hope. And yet the, the giving uh, and the ways that people are giving uh, at the younger, in the younger ages of 20 and 30 yeah. and so forth is very, very different. What would you say about that? Very different. Um, uh, our, I don't think we're the same age, so, our, 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 but our, generally our generation, mm -hmm. um, uh, is institutionally driven. Um, this younger group is causal driven. They don't really yet um, connect to institutions per se and consistently give to them. What they will do is when there's a need, they'll go after it. Mm -hmm. And they'll put money toward it and service toward it. That's different. And the institutions in Charlotte and the United States are grappling with that generational shift because it's, it's in the moment, but it's not looking yet long-term in sustainability issues that we would say that older adults do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what that means for 30 years from now, uh, but, it's, but it's very different. I would also say, I think we are in some ways preventing them from being institutionally connected. Because we are so spry now in our 60s, 70s, and 80s, if you think about putting a board together of a nonprofit, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s are all active now. Putting seven generations of a board uh, on your board just doesn't happen. We skew toward the 50s, 60s, 70s, and now 80s, and it takes to 40 or more to be as actively involved. That was not always the case. And so we need to get these younger people in more, I think, um, leadership roles in these institutions, and some of us need to get off the stage. Hmm. Let's talk about that third category, and I want to put it in the context of uh, systems. Systems in Washington, um, systems that uh, work to cultivate reality, um, whether they be laws or policies, uh, and to hold that up against this troubling statistic that only 18% of Americans are actually showing up mm -hmm. um, beyond voting. Obviously, the voting is um, troubling as well, 50% or less. Um, but to think that there are uh, I mean, some of the great movements, particularly around the civil rights movement, or as a fundamentally uh, a political movement, challenging sort of the powers and principalities. Um, without that, 
uh, there can really be no change. So I'm wondering how you think about um, the degree to which people are engaged in, in a civic manner, whether that be showing up to community meetings, having conversations with uh, people, politicians, people in power who, who set policy. What, what, do you, what would you say about that? Um, well, a couple things. Um, first, I would say that in my explanation of this profound concept of the tax deduction, the end story there plays in part to your question. And the end story is that if you're a board member on a nonprofit, you are essentially using tax dollars that would otherwise have gone to the government. So you are actually an extension of a represented democracy. Mm. So the fact that millions of us are serving on nonprofit boards um, is a is a really important piece of this civic engagement because they are very actively civic engaged, mm -hmm. civically engaged. <clears throat> Beyond that sphere, um, we are in a time frame that, at least in my life, is uh, uh, the most in civil time that I've seen. And the question is, how are we going to bring people together outside of the structure we have, which is the nonprofit system, which helps us? Um, part of the reason the foundation got into civic engagement and civic leadership in a big way is because I kept watching uh, uh, citizens go down to City Hall and just yell at the City Council. Um, there was, that doesn't, there's no civic engagement there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to spend more time, more energy, and more effort in getting people together in constellations that are not in defined, defined institutions mm -hmm. like the nonprofit system. And when we get there, we've got huge, huge challenges mm -hmm. because um, we're all coming with a different set of uh, data points now. It used to be, I mean, you all know this, it used to be we saw three net TV networks, we had one newspaper, and the market required those entities to be fairly balanced. They might lean one way or another, but they were fairly balanced. So when we came to the water cooler, we all had something to talk about. Now, when we do civic engagement, we have to start with not the conversation, but hours of, co of people coming together just to agree on the data set. We no longer begin with the conversation of the subject at hand in terms of, of, of what we're going to do. We have to back up and start with try to leave your beliefs at the door and let's agree on the data. And then bring your beliefs in on top of that. 20 years ago, I didn't have to do that when I got people together. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we can't even agree on the facts, <laughs> we, can't, we can't get anywhere. So we, have, we spent a lot of time in civic engagement on can we agree on the facts? And one example of that, Chip, which um, I'm very proud of, is the Leading on Opportunity Report, the Upward Mobility Economic Opportunity Report. Um, but I want you to know it took 20 citizens uh, 18 months to hammer out, and it took months of just examining data. And let me give you one example where religious lines divided the group. Mm -hmm. um, we got to the discussion of the fact that um, would the report recommend contraception? And why that came up was because statistically, if a single mom in poverty has an unwanted child, that child as an adult statistically will always stay in poverty, always. Um, eventually, ministers and people of faith on that group, after a lot of battling, decided that they had to put contraception in mm. rather than just abstinence because the statistics were overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But it took them a long way to get there. Now, the report is much bigger than just that topic, but that's a microcosm of what we're facing with when we bring people together mm -hmm. to get movement forward. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in the role that you play um, as a convener. Um, I'm wondering what it's like for you when you begin that process, when you reach out. You know, you, you've spoken 
a, a little bit about um, some of what you, but I, what you anticipate and some of the challenges of, of the data set. But what do you think it means um, in this increasingly diverse culture where there has been tremendous underrepresentation, uh, particularly to stake, stakeholders that we, uh, that we are so-called serving. Um, how do you think about perhaps the old way that people would convene? Um, and what do you think is the new way that when we begin to sort of sit down to have a conversation, uh, who needs to be at the table? Yeah. So the old way was a belief by the leadership uh, in our community that we were an ever-expanding table. If you wanted to come to our table and bring to it whatever you wanted, uh -huh. the table could forever expand. Um, it's no longer that way. There are a lot of us who like to believe it's that way, but it's no longer that way. People started saying, it's good for you to have that table, but I'm going to create another table. Mm. So now our energy is on connecting all of those tables. And when we go into the civic engagement space, I find that not only to get the collective wisdom out of who's at the table, there's great symbolism in people seeing who's at the table. So for instance, when we launched the Leading Opportunity Study, we had um, uh, D. Odell Charit, who um, born with silver spoon, white in uh, male in Mississippi, and Ophelia Garman Brown, who grew up in the projects of Detroit and made it out, and, um, and a physician and a minister. That symbolism was really important. Symbolism was, of course, the committee was made up of that, of that diversity as well. It makes it messier, it takes longer, it's harder, and I find that the corporate executives in town get frustrated with the time it takes to get things done. Uh, that's not just the way they do things within their company. Um, and so we have to have everybody at the table, and, and, and we're in the process right now with this new arts initiative. Uh, there'll be 18 people on the arts initiative, and we're spending weeks, if not months, trying to piece together a group of folks who will make these decisions that everybody feels that their voice is in the room. Hmm. It's a lot harder. I'm struck that w when we think about sort of the, the loss of civility and the recovery of civility, that one of the things that you continually do is to invite people to think about the common good. Mm -hmm. There's always this conversation about the common good and how can we uh, how can we come together across that? I wonder if you could say something about trust, uh, because I think you know you um, you know so well some of the uh, the lack of trust um, in our city uh, on the basis of a whole host of of mm -hmm. of, of issues um, and and realities and differences. Uh, what does it mean? to bring people together, and how does one bring people together uh, appreciating the, the profound lack of trust? And how, how have you seen people build trust, perhaps you know, in the context of the Opportunity Task Force uh, and other things? What do, how do people build trust, and when do you know that you're, you're, you're there? And are you ever there there <laughs> versus, well, let's see where this goes? There's a phrase that you may have heard that um, progress me, progress, um, well, let, me, let me try to get it right. Progress happens, progress is made at the speed of trust, hmm. which I think is a pretty profound mm -hmm. um, observation. And so building trust is actually part of a lot of this civic engagement work, uh, for instance. Uh, 20 years ago, we didn't have to begin a group of people coming together establishing principles of engagement. Mm. How are we going to treat each other in this session? How are we going to respect each other's voice? How are we, you know, I've even gone to th situations where um, 
Um, we even allow um, uh, someone to have a, a, a piece of cloth that pass around when they want to get on their soapbox and they go over and they just get on their soapbox and they <laughs> yell and scream and they, you know, because, because it's hard with the emotions in the room um, to always be as respectful as you might like. So building that trust in a group of people that have never been together takes a lot of, a lot of time. I think you know what happens when you begin to see um, uh, people open up with things they might not tell people. And let me give you an example. <clears throat> About five years ago, um, we helped orchestrate a group called the Charlotte Executive Leadership Council, which is 25 CEOs in the community because we were seeing their social capital decline. There were a lot of new CEOs that didn't know each other, um, and we felt that we needed to build the trust and relationships with them so they could unite in doing things for the community, of which they have done a lot in the last couple of years together. Um, it took two years mm -hmm. before those CEOs really did anything, mm -hmm. and it was just building relationships of people who clearly don't have the issue of wealth differences, yeah. just experiential differences. And it was, and, and, and you see it, I, 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 I'll, after George Floyd's murder, I will never forget where an African-American corporate executive on this group opened up to the group and said, this, this kind of conversation doesn't happen at the CEO level, cross CEOs that I know of, at least in a group formal setting. Um, this, this gentleman said, I was driving down Providence Road, he lives in South Charlotte, African American male, and he was stopped, and the police officer said, what are you doing on this side of town? He shared that with Brian Moynihan, <laughs> and I thought, okay, <laughs> trust has been built. <laughs> so I look for those moments. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but they take a while to get. Yeah. Well, um, I want to shift. Uh, we're going to carry forward these ideas as we start to talk about Charlotte. And so um, you, you deal with so many people both in Charlotte, but people that are thinking about Charlotte and coming to Charlotte and being engaged in Charlotte. Um, how do you describe Charlotte to, <laughs> to people? Uh, let me contrast how I described Charlotte to people five years ago okay. and how I describe Charlotte to people today. Um, five years ago, or maybe even seven years ago, before the national study that said we were 50 out of 50 in upper mobility, which stunned us all, mm. I would have described Charlotte as a meritocracy, that Charlotte thinks of itself as a meritocracy. If you have talent, if you have commitment, if you have energy, you will do well in Charlotte. And I think that pretty much defined what many of us thought about Charlotte at the time. Um, we learned that that isn't true. Um, that doesn't mean that talent doesn't count, in a, you know, uh, but this notion that I think was very Charlotte of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps um, is just not true. In fact, I don't know if any if you know this, that analogy actually comes from a century ago in a cartoon where someone was pulling up their bootstraps to try to get over the fence and couldn't do it. And the cartoon was it was a, it was is ludicrous. We went from that to people thinking that pulling yourself up by your bootstraps is a way to progress. Yeah. I mean, think about it. How do you how do you pull yourself up if you're holding your bootstrap? I mean, it doesn't even work. Right. But that's what Charlotte, or at least the leadership of Charlotte, thought about itself. Mm -hmm. Now what I say, um, which is not too much different, but enough that I think is, 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 is worthy of who we are. Um, if you are here in Charlotte now and coming to Charlotte now, um, you're coming to city in the life cycle that few cities in the United States are in at the moment, where we are being baked. What we do in the next 25 years will bake us. Boston's baked, New York's baked, LA's baked, Atlanta's baked, we're not baked yet. We have a history, we're an older city, 
But in terms of what we will be as a city, we're being baked. And if you bring your ingredients and put it into the oven with us, you can have a profound impact on this community. Mm -hmm. And that means someone who is poor and someone who is wealthy. And I think that's, that's what I would describe Charlotte. We're a city baking. What, well, say more about that. I mean, why are we in the oven? Uh, <laughs> what, what is it about that this, where we're baking? What, why, what, what does that mean that we're baking? Well, let me ask you this. Okay. Let me ask the audience this. Um, can anybody really define Charlotte? People have struggled with this. They, they, they try to define us by, you know, do we have an iconic physical f figure like Seattle has a, uh, or St. Louis has the arch or, or whatever. Do they, do, do, they don't want to define us as a banking center because we could lose that. They don't want, I mean, I don't think we're defined. Mm -hmm. um, but when you, think of, when you think of places like Boston and Seattle, you have a clear thought about what makes them tick. Yes. And I don't think we know who we are. Mm. Interesting. And I just see that in lots of different ways mm -hmm. that we're going about doing things. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you share that. I'd be curious. Do you think we're baking or do you think we're baked? No, I definitely think that we are going through an identity crisis. Yes. And, um, and I think for me, uh, when I think about the narrative of meritocracy, I mean, I'm, I'm struck that um, that's a very white male take. Right. Um, and I think we have, uh, we are learning, and we have so, you know, so far to go to appreciate that that's never been the story of right. Charlotte. Um, for, for countless people as we think about a host of different things that we could, we could spend, and we probably need to do a deep history of Charlotte and hear all the voices that you've worked so hard to, to listen to. Um, but I, I'm struck that we're not, you know, we're gonna be this sort of, um, we're gonna continually go through an identity crisis until we can bring voices to the table and, right. to, and, to, and experiences to build a shared reality. Um, and I think that's really challenging for all the reasons yeah. you just described, lack of trust for good reason, uh, yeah. and how we do that. You know, so that's why I'm, I'm really, really interested, and, I'm, and I wonder, Michael, if, there, if this pandemic is gonna create an opportunity for us. Um, I, I wanna go f just for a moment to that, that phone call that came from your office, in which we, you, you summoned a lot of people. Well, I hope I didn't summon them. <laughs> well, well, no, I think you did, and I, and I think that's okay. Um, you did summon us together to say, hey, something's happening. And what I was struck by, and I'm, and I'm so grateful for, is there was incredible diversity at the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, you brought so many people together from, I mean, I don't know how you did it, but only, I think only you could do it with your knowledge of the city and, and all, across all the sort of spheres of culture uh, um, and different, insti different types of institutions, men, women, uh, black, white, uh, Latino, every, the whole mix. And what was going through your head? Why did you call us together uh, down at the Foundation for the Carolinas? Um, I think that it is why I try to be an agent of calling people together in general, and that is, I don't think we've lost the belief in common good, but I don't think we know what it means anymore, mm -hmm. and I don't think we know the practices required to get there. Um, and so I've kind of committed my work to trying to build common good. Yeah. And, I, and you can't build it unless you've got all the different voices in the room. Mm -hmm. And we can't just build it in the macro. We have to build it in spots, affordable housing, public school reform, the arts, whatever, whatever the subject is. It's building it in multiple different um, uh, um, settings and spheres. Um, 
but I think we have, we haven't lost the belief in it, but we may have lost the practice of it. Mm. And, and so, um, you know, obviously we're still in the pandemic, but I wonder what you see happening now in Charlotte that's been fundamentally changed by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, 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 it, that's an interesting question because I, I've seen some things that have been reinforced by the pandemic. Mm. For instance, um, we have always been really good on the philanthropy side of coming together to get things done. And I, I've checked this out with other cities and other colleagues. You know, the United Way and the Foundation came together really before the stimulus money was even done in Congress and raised $24 million immediately to keep people housed and fed and uh, and I, that was raised in one month and that's a really great part of charlotte that i think was reinforced and then we just did it again in raising 23 million for the arts because they're in trouble um what's interesting about that campaign that relates to the the pandemic that is no surprise but it was all done on zoom I mean, Zoom has become a noun, an adjective, and a verb. <laughs> um, we got 30 uh, philanthropic and corporate leaders together in four Zoom sessions and raised that money in four weeks. Mm. It would have taken me months. <laughs> so it, it's interesting that the pandemic has, it's a paradox of life. It has brought us together more and it has isolated us more. Mm. I can now sit in a meeting with a group and touch and be touched by more people through the technology from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting than I can in person. And yet, we're all feeling isolated. Mm. Mental health issues are skyrocketing because of the isolation. So in some ways, it's it's the paradox of life. Some things have improved and, and taught, brought us to new places and it's torn down other things. Mm -hmm. um, I think we'll emerge from it in a good place in Charlotte. Um, and I think we have new tools than we had before. But in some ways, I've seen the best of Charlotte during it. Um, the mm -hmm. fact that we, early on, we raised a million masks before masks were readily available. It was mm -hmm. boom. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, I'd actually like to believe that we've seen some of the best of us in the, in the worst of times. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, we are, we're still baking and this is an inflection point. Well, let me do give you a couple examples of the baking. Okay. Just, just yeah, to, yeah. No, I'm, I think it's just a great no, cause, description. Cause I, I, I think, so we're at the point and I'm going to do it in some isolated areas. Are we going to have public schools we're proud of, or are we not? We're baking that. that we're, it's a defining moment. We're down to 29% because of the pandemic and third graders being proficient in mm. reading. Mm. Are we gonna bake the schools so that they succeed? Are we gonna bake our transportation system? Right? Our transportation is not really set yet. These other cities I talked about, it's set. Wow. You know, this, if, you, if you look at the baking in different isolated subject matters, I think you'll see that we're not baked. Yeah, that's that's maybe my best way to explain it. Um, anyway, go where you're. No, going. I mean, I, I um, I'm really glad that you said that because I think that definitely takes us down into and and we could go across, as you know better than than I do, across all the various institutions and um, and things that we need in order to be a thriving city. Um, but I guess I want to ask you, um, as we look ahead, as we think about sort of the state of generosity uh, in America, as we think about the story um, of our city uh, and the need to really understand the story of our city, mm -hmm. um, as we think about all these important things that you raised today are, are, are around uh, civility, and a focus for the common good. Um, how would you encourage us as a church to think about our generosity? Mm -hmm. um, and what do you think 
is the best way for us to engage in the civic space, knowing that uh, how we engage in the civic space is incredibly important, as you described so well, to any trust building uh, and any transformation. Okay, I'm gonna take a bit of a risk. Go ahead, I'm, that's why I invited you. <laughs> um, as you know, over the years, I've convened ministers. Mm -hmm. And um, I have always believed that the power of houses of worship in this community is extraordinary. And I believe their individual work, such as this church, in fact, the Myers Park churches in general, with their generosity and what they're doing in the community is quite extraordinary. But we have not unleashed the collective power of the faith community. And I don't know how we do that, but my dream would be that if the faith community were to come together, it could transform this community because of the number of church, house of worship, I don't want to use church because we have other religions, because of the number of people we have there, um, because those great faiths teach all similar things and when it comes to generosity and philanthropy, um, goodwill to others, if they could ever come together and it's great for one church to help one neighborhood in affordable housing, as an example. I don't want to in any way dispute that. That is fantastic. But imagine if they all came together, <laughs> where could we go? And my hope on that is that um, the issues that have divided us such as, in, in, as faith, people of faith, such as things like gay marriage, pro-life, pro-choice, those things, for so long might be put aside and I'm seeing the interest of churches regardless of those wedge issues in the issues of poverty and the issues of stewardship of God's creation, the earth, I'm seeing them come together more and more and letting the wedge issues go aside. Mm. And so I don't know how we unleash the power of the collective. So you asked me what one single church can do, and I would say that's not the question I'm gonna answer. <laughs> I'm gonna answer what could all the churches do? Yeah. Well, I think that that is a, it's a bold idea. Um, and it's something I know we long for. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, there are so many differences across uh, different communities, um, even mainline Christian denominations. There are. I mean, this is a... But if we find the points where exactly. we intersect, um, which is more and more challenging, and if we can put some mm -hmm. of these other things aside, I think there's great, great, great power in it. Um, and the diversity that we have in the churches, uh, do, do you know that we are now 40% white, non-Hispanic? And even Hispanics who identify as white brings us up to 48%. We are no longer a majority white city. Now, everybody knew about that in our schools. So I, the question is, is every other person you meet a person of color in your day, in our day? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, so it's gonna get increasingly challenge, challenging to get people with the levels of diversity we're experiencing. But we are what we will be as a nation in 2043. So if we get it here right in Charlotte, we could be a model for the rest of the nation. Yep. I've just gone off the Duke board after 12 years, and Duke's now 50% students of color. And there's a barbell of students on scholarships and highly wealthy, and there's a huge number of international students. The tensions on Duke's campus are significant mm. because we've essentially thrown all those students together with people so different from them and living together. And my last salvo to the board was, if we don't get it right on this campus, in 2043, when we flip, 
These will be leaders. They'll be in their 40s. These will be leaders of our community. If we don't get it right on campus, what's the hope? Yeah. And I'd say that about Charlotte. Let's get it right here. And we've all done it. My church has done it. Black and white choir exchanges don't get us there. No. Uh, our church, um, I'm a Providence Methodist, our church uh, about 15 years ago decided that it wanted to integrate racially. Interesting results. Uh, we have a handful of families who are black, but they're Jamaican. It's the Anglican tradition. We didn't have African Americans from other cultural traditions mm -hmm. join us. Um, so there are all these barriers to, uh, to overcoming yeah. our differences. Well, I, I think you're, you're leaving us with a really uh, Im important challenge to think about what it means for us as a, as a church to be civically engaged in this uh, inflection point in this, in this season and for us to look at that clearly and to understand that the next 10 years are going to be essential. Um, what I can pledge to you is um, this church is going to be at the table and is going to be seeking to build relationships across difference. We're going to be seeking uh, to, uh, to, be, to, do, to do more listening than talking and to see what we can do to learn about the life of this city, to appreciate its history, um, but also to dream dreams that are not necessarily our dreams, but are the dreams of others who, mm -hmm. who we, we haven't really listened to. Uh, and, uh, and I'm really excited about that because I think that's what it means to be a 21st century Christian. Mm -hmm. As you have, have framed so well in so many ways, you can see these things as great challenges or you can see them as great opportunities. Right. And what I love is on this day in which we're talking about the power of hope, um, that, that with God's help, we can do this. And this is, in fact, God's vision of, um, of being able to... to, to uh, create this place that we call the kingdom of God where everyone has the opportunity to become fully alive. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work to be done uh, to figure out how to do that. But what I so appreciate, Michael, is your generous life, your generous example, and the way in which God has moved in you through so many different experiences uh, and the way that you have remained uh, a perpetual learner. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and a deep inspiration. And so I just wanna say on behalf of all of us here today, um, we thank you for dedicating your life to a life of generosity, for all that you've done for this city, uh, for the ways in which you have created opportunity, and, uh, and for all that we'll be able to do to together moving forward. Um, we're profundly thank grateful you. for your leadership. Thank you thank so you. much for being here today.